Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 128. Psalm 128. I'm not going to expound on this psalm, but I'm using, his, using it as an excuse to open today's subject in our series of commitments of the church committed to raise a godly family. Psalm 128, the word of God reads in our translations, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord who walks in his ways. When you eat the work out of your hands, blessed will you be and it will be well with you. Your wife will be like a vine bearing fruit on the sides of your house. Your children like olive plants around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion and see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life and see your children's children Peace be upon Israel. And that is a reading of God's word. Let us pray once again. Father, we commit the exposition and the reading of your word to you as we have committed the singing of praises also. Please receive it in the name of Christ. And may your Holy Spirit help us and help anyone who gathers around Christ wherever your people meet. May your kingdom come. May your name be sanctified. May your will be done to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Is it relevant to be committed to raise a godly family? It's a rhetorical question. Is it important? Does it really matter? If you saw the Olympics inauguration, then you were exposed to drag queens and to the mockery of Da Vinci's painting of the Lord's Supper. And I know the apologists say, no, 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 that was a, the Baco feast. Had nothing to do with religious issues. You're yeah, right. And if you know who Iman or Imain Caliph is, and if you don't, well, perhaps you're living under a rock. Please come out of your rock. Is this boxer that initially was accused of being hyper androgynist, but that she was really a woman, but oh, lo and behold, she has XY chromosomes. It just happens that the institution that had this barred her or him uh, is not recognized by the Olympics or by the International Olympics Committee. So she was fighting, or he was fighting, an individual with XY chromosomes, women. But no big deal, because no big deal. Sex is not biology, sex is preference. And uh, a worldview that considers that, and public agendas and political agendas that say that hormone treatment in minors and mutilation surgeries in minors are a matter of right and choice, not of biology or morals, that's the world we live in. That is what our children are being taught from elementary school, high school, college, university, media, social media, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So unless <laughs> I am the only one who's aware of these things and, and, and you are not, then it's not important to be given to raise a godly family. That's our reality, folks. And part of our commitment as a church family is the commitment to raise a godly family. Now, in the psalm I just read to you, it's very interesting. It's a poem. It has certain structures that I'm not going to go into detail as to how it is written. But, it, but, but Hebrew poetry is, is fascinating. It's, it's made of parallel thoughts. It seems to repeat the same things with different worlds. So we get the point. Verses 1 and 4 two and three say exactly the same. And the subject is God's blessings manifested in our families. That seems to be a running theme in the Old Testament and New Testament scriptures. 
the blessing of God is primarily seen at home. Success, says a billionaire whose name I cannot find, but it's a famous YouTube clip. <laughs> Success, and this guy is a billionaire, is when your adult children want to talk to you. This is the greatest title I've been called in my life, he says, is dad. That's success. This is an individual who, by any chance, appears to be a Christian. And the psalmist says, happy, blessed, blessed of God, favored by God, is the individual, the man in this case, who fears Jehovah, who fears Yahweh. Fearing Yahweh in Scripture, it's an ethical thing. It means fear, afraid, phobia, reverence, love, adoration, but primarily Fearing God is the word in Proverbs 8.13, the fear of God is to depart from evil, is to abstain from evil. For the Jews, these concepts always had an ethical implication. And this fear of the God is nothing else, according to the psalmist, to walk in his ways. And then that person has the promise of a blessing. Which one? He will eat of the fruit of his labors, of his diligent labors. Proverbs says the diligent hands prosper. Poverty is a result of being lazy, <laughs> according to Scripture. Unless you have a providential hindrance, I have a special daughter. I understand that some people cannot work and need help. But for the ones of us who are kind of not special, if we are poor, at least in this society, in this country, we are poor because we have chosen the path of poverty by not working diligently with our hands. And the one who talks to you is not one who has inherited anything, by the way. And he says, you will thrive in everything you do. It's an aphorism. It's not an absolute. Some godly people are really struggling. Some godly people who fear the Lord, who have worked hard, have lost it all. Yes, because things happen. But under general terms, the psalmist is saying, if, if you're godly, if you fear the Lord, if you abstain from evil, if you're diligent, God will prosper the work of your hands, and your family will be blessed. And then it uses this imagery of a wife being like a vine that is fruitful, and your children being like olive plants, and olives give oil that is used for healing, for anointing, as a condiment, as a, as a food. So you will prosper. Your family will be blessed. Your children will be medicine and health and joy to you then my suggestion is we should prepare our children to be that kind of men and our daughters to be that kind of women who know how to choose that kind of men. Is raising a godly family relevant? Well, look around and you let me know if it is or not. Where do we start? How do we start? The first thing I suggest to you, and I told you I was not going to make an exposition of the psalm. I'm just going to give tips and pieces of advice about the issue of the commitment to raising a godly family is pray. Pray for your children and pray for your children's children. But I submit to you, pray with hope. We are in Cornerstone, a confessional 1689 Baptist church. What does that mean? It means that we baptize believers. We are credo Baptists. We baptize people who consciously come to the Lord, profess consciously and voluntarily their faith in Christ, and as the result of having a good conscience, they want to obey the commandment of Christ that disciples are baptized. Because we only baptize disciples, we are called Baptists historically. Now, there is a group of brethren whom we love and whose theology we have borrowed, even our confession, except in the Baptist area, who are the Pado baptists the Presbyterians. And they baptize children. Now, I don't agree with the baptism of children in any shape or form, but I agree with something Presbyterians do and their argument for doing it. You know why they do it? They do it in the hope of the covenant promise that God will bless us and our children and our children's children. In fact, Peter said that, preaching the gospel to the Jews. 
in Acts 2.39, the promise of Christ, the promise of Messiah is for you and your children. But he adds, and for all whom the, God, whom the Lord God calls. Because yes, God has to call them. They have to be called effectually and be brought to Christ. But there's still a promise. He, the Philippian jailer was told, was given that promise. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Now, the household believed and were baptized. But there's still this covenant promise that God will remember those who love him and keep his commandments upon thousands. Thousands and thousands of them will be remembered. So we pray and we pray for our children's children. I had prayed for my daughter's husband since she was about four or five, for Miguel's wife since he was about four or five, and then I started praying for their children, and now I'm praying for my grandchildren's children. And I tell the Lord, and, and keep, keep it rolling. You said it's thousands upon thousands, so even if Jesus hasn't come in a thousand years, I keep praying for those offspring, that they may be raised and taught in the fear and instruction of the Lord. Even my daughter has told me once, my prayer for my children, she has two now because one is in the womb, or the next one, she says, is that they may not know what it is not to live with Christ. She says, I don't know when I came to the Lord, I was little, I don't know exactly when I gave my heart to him, but one thing I know, I don't know what it is not to be living and walking with him and that's what i pray for my children i pray that for my grandchildren too so pray pray for your children salvation pray for your children that the kingdom of god may come upon them and i challenge you with this question what do you pray for your children do you pray that they may find the best school that they may perhaps go even to an Ivy League school? That they may get a great scholarship in sports? That they perhaps may excel in some grandiose career? Is that what you pray for them? Or do you feel the throne of God with tears beseeching and begging for their souls? We are called to raise a godly generation. The main evangelism we do, we do it at home with our own. Pray for your children and for your children's children and pray with hope. Secondly, we do that by instructing them. Instructing them what? Scripture says we are to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And that training of our children never stops until we die. We're always training them. Now, the training changes from a little baby that you're basically the caretaker, the provider, the feeder 24-7. You have to do everything for that baby. Then you become kind of a custodian as the child starts to grow and you start to train them. And then it takes the shape of being a teacher and a coach. And then it comes to a point that it becomes like being a consultant. Because they keep growing. And eventually they don't need your training anymore. But once in a blue moon you may get a picture with a tongue colored blue and being asked, what exactly is this tongue blue? What does this mean? Or this happened to my child, can you help me with that? Or whatever the question is, sometimes you just become a consultant. But the point is, that teaching never ever ends. And we are called to train our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. But that training has stages. You first train them to obey. The simple things of don't touch, no, <laughs> and they have to do it at your normal tone of voice, at your normal command in the first time. Not one, not two, two and a half, two and three quarters, and they are still haven't done it. No, you teach them to obey first time obedience, to behave. They can be trained and taught. It takes time, it takes labor. It takes love, it takes patience, but
but they have to be trained. And they are also trained in righteousness. Righteousness in scripture, dikaios, the righteousness of God, the character of God, the demands of God, the expectations of God, justice. And that is another word for the gospel. Yes, you have to teach them Christ. You have to teach them the gospel. You have to teach them the difference between law and gospel, which are not the same. Only the gospel, according to Romans 1.16, is the power of God unto salvation. We parents, for some reason, well, no, take it back. We Christians, <laughs> even though we think that the book of Galatians is for the church next door, <laughs> the book of Galatians is for us. We start well. We start by faith. We start by the verse Tony read to us. You have been saved by grace through faith. And that is the work of God. And it is not of you. It is not by works so that no one should boast. But for some reason down the line, we start to leave the grace and come into the area of do's and don'ts. And somehow, some way, our righteousness becomes our performance and our obedience and how well we're doing. And we pass it on to our children. So we raise our children with lip service to the gospel, but we really tell them that to be pleasing to us and to God, they have to behave well. And there's nothing wrong with behaving well, but the only basis to please us or to please God is Jesus. He did it all. He paid it all. He behaved in our place. He died in our place. Now, we teach that gospel also according to the stages where our children are. I remember many years ago that I was sparing the rod from one of my children, and I said, I'm going to spare you the rod because I want you to understand mercy. I want you to understand what grace is. Jesus took our punishment on the cross. Jesus took the chastisement that was due us. And I'm going to spare it from you so you understand that Jesus went through it in your place. Now, from there on, he wanted mercy to be applied all the time. And sometimes you have to say, no, 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 not this time. This time you need to really feel the weight of discipline. But regardless, just remember that the law has no power whatsoever to execute what it commands. You know what the law is? You know what do's and don'ts are? Don't do this, do that. This is what you ought to do. If you want to please God, do you know what is that? Go out to the turnpike and find me the first sign that says Orlando. It may say 220 miles or 200 miles or 180 miles, whatever it says. And you see the sign that says Orlando, Disney, 200 miles. And you just stop the car right there, park it, and climb on the sign. And you just wait there. And your kid says, Dad, Dad what are you doing? Orlando, 200 miles. Dad, we have to move in the car. Yeah, but it's this here. It's Disney, 200 miles. You can't make it. The law only has the power to tell you what God wants. How is God like what he expects, but it has no power to make you do it. The law is useless to execute what it commands. Nothing can be done by the law. Only to point sin, to point to God. And if you get the point, there's something the law does well. It points you to Christ. When you are at your wit's end, when you realize that you cannot make it on your own, and to some of us, it happened decades after being professing believers. You can't. Then the law says, look at one who did it all. He lived perfectly, active obedience, and on the cross, he suffered the consequence and the demands of the law upon sinners. Passive obedience. Look to him, run to him, believe in him, and you shall be saved. You teach that to your children. Even when you teach them to obey the first time at your normal tone of voice. Grace triumphs 
over regulations and and the contents of that grace is the Word of God. You teach them according to 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. When Paul tells Timothy, preach the Word. What are you supposed to preach in church? The Word. What do we talk about? The Bible. Exhort, teach, reprove, instruct with all patience and doctrine. Oh, but you, you, in Cornerstone, you guys don't tell nice stories for us to feel good about ourselves. No, that's not the subject we're commanded to teach. We're commanded to teach you the word and from it teach, reproof, rebuke, encourage, whatever the case may be for you and for me. And you men, and if you're a single mother, you ladies, you are the pastors of your household. You are the ones who have to instruct those things to your children regularly, formally, objectively. If you really hope that Debbie and Wade and Michael and Lynn, who didn't come today, and whomever else of you, and I'm sorry I'm dropping names and I may lose you, uh, teach Sunday school? You're hoping that that half an hour of Sunday school is going to cut it? Then you have your hope in the wrong place. Oh, but I pay lots of money for this Christian school. You're hoping that the Christian school is going to be doing what you're called to do? It's not going to happen either. It is your call to teach your children. How? According to Proverbs 16, 6. With mercy and with truth, sin is corrected. You teach both. You teach truth, you do it in love and in mercy. Thirdly, providing for our children. Providing, yes, physical provision. You have to be and have to provide men. And if you're single women, and I realize that's the society we're in, you have to be the example of hard, diligent work, putting bread on your table for your children. Your children will know what it is to, what it is a hard working man from observing dad. Your children will know consistency from observing dad. I know the world has changed. I know I'm an old boomer, passe, and I don't know nothing about life. I know it. I'm, being, I'm reminded of that frequently. But I'll say this. The few resumes that I had to review, and I'm saying few tongue-in-cheek, first thing I go after is work history. And if I see a job every year, put it out. But the guy has a, two masters and a PhD. I don't care. Not consistent. Not interested in people who are not consistent. Does that mean you have to work for the same company 34 years as you have? No, I didn't say that. All I'm saying is that your children will learn hard, consistent, diligent, excellent work through thick and thin through you men, not through some special master's class at some special university. That's all I'm saying. Now, it's not only the provision of physical things, it's the provision of spiritual things. Why? Because Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but from every word, by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus said, do not work for the food that perishes, but the food that stands unto eternal life, which the Son of Man will provide to you. Providing spiritual food includes providing emotional stability. Emotional and physical stability. There are lots of people out there who live insecure, because that roof that God designed for us to learn shelter and security was not provided for them when they were little, when they were at home. They lived with wobbly parents, wobbly mothers, wobbly fathers who changed with the wind and who never provided for them emotional stability. Men, that's your call. And if you're a single mother, that's your call too, even in your circumstances. You know what is the main source of that stability? Your marriage. Children will learn stability from observing how mom and dad 
deal with each other. Children will learn that stability from observing that God has the first place in my house and that is non-negotiable and mom and dad take the second place and we are in the third welcome guest status. We're not the center of the house. God is. And mom and dad are the pillars of the house, not us. Modeling the home they aspire to have. And you know what that takes? Quality time. I have news for you. Quantity and quality. You have to be there, and you have to be there a lot, and frequently, and close by. Oh, but you know what? I don't have time, but... Every week, I take those 20 minutes having an ice cream with my children, and that's quality time. Well, it's kind of quality because I'm also checking the phone. No, it doesn't work that way. It's pouring yourselves into them. They play baseball like yours, sometimes playing catch to the point of asking for a couple of Advils and not even telling them, right? Give me an Advil, but don't let him know that I had an Advil because I couldn't keep up with him. If it, that's what it takes, amen. That's what it takes, amen. If it takes doing it with a fever, with cold, coughing, let it be so. <laughs> Guys, this world is filled with people that have absent parents and absent fathers. And they go out there and become a disaster to society and become victims and victimized and expect the government and the world to solve their problems of entitlement. Because they were not taught at home, because they did not grow in a home that is committed to raise godly families forcefully. Teach them the priority of commitment to a local church. And yes, I'm going to put a plug for Cornerstone here. Where will they learn that church is important? Well, we, where will our children understand that church is a physical, tangible expression of redemption? These are the people for whom Christ died. Well, they will see how mom and dad deal with each other. They will see the gospel modeled in marriage. If you have any doubts about why marriage is so much attacked and why the statistics of marriage are as bad in church as they are in the world, it's because marriage from the beginning is the institution God created to show his unconditional, unconditional love for his people. And then they will learn it by seeing how you treat the bride of Christ, the church. Oh, I love the universal church. I follow every website of important churches online. No. How do you treat the local church? The one you are attached. The one you know. The one you associate with. Whatever it is, be it this one or another one you choose. They will learn it at home. Let me give you these stats. Scary to me. Actually, when I read it, I was... I'm sorry, I'm going to say something very negative, but, but I was glad that I was not in, in, in that age bracket when I heard it. But many of you are with your children. 70% of young people... This is a 2022... Uh, 2022 stats. 70,000 of young people stop attending church when they leave high school. I don't know about you, but that to me is freaking scary. 70% of young people stop attending church after high school? The stat finishes, well, half of them return a, de a decade later. Do you want to know some of the reasons? Here's the first one. This is, by the way, published by an institution called churchleaders.com. I don't know who they are. That's what they published. First reason why they leave church. Because the church is relevant. You didn't hear me wrong. And they write that. Because the church is relevant. Not irrelevant. Relevant. What does that mean? That the church offers exactly the same thing the world offers. If I come to church and the music, the preaching, the entertainment, whatever they offer is exactly the same I will find in the world, why do I have to bother coming to church? What is different about church? You know what Jesus said about salt? 
When the salt loses its flavor, it's only good for the place where you dump the animal's feces. Not my words. Jesus said it. It's as good as to bring it to a latrine or just a pile of manure and put it there. And we are desperately trying to attract young people by being cool and young families by having cool programs for their children. And they leave, 70% of them. And the survey says, yeah, because you're exactly the same as what we find on the streets. So why do we need you? Ouch. Secondly, because the parents try to pass their feelings of religion, not truth about religion. But you have to feel God, feel Him. <laughs> but they were not taught Scripture. They were not taught theology. Dad didn't open the Bible and says, Thus says the Lord, and this is what it means. No, they were not taught that. They were just taught the fun things, the nice things, the feelings, the emotions that God told me. But not thus, says the Lord. Thirdly, they were never part of the community. They were never part of the church. They're just the children. And I try to pray, working on my notes, talking. I try to be aware of where you are and who you are. Because I'm old. I know I'm old. 61, it's old, ancient for you. But I remember sitting in mass, saying, when is this guy's guy going to finish so that I can go play baseball? Because they tortured me putting the mass hour exactly at the time baseball hour was. And there I was listening to the guy, just looking at the field and the guys warming up and me here sitting in mass. So I'm aware of that. I'm aware of how boring this can be. Only God can make it non-boring. I do my best with what I have. And fourthly, they get tired of pretending. They get tired of pretending. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. I'm well, and you I'm so well. How's the family wonderful? And you're lying, lying through your teeth. I'll tell you what happened to me not too long ago. A young man comes to my office, weeping, and he's confessing a grievous sin. And he's weeping about it. The sins that we don't talk about in church. And he was done. I says, if I had a trophy, or if I had a set of trophies in my office, and I had a big one, I would get you the, big, the biggest one, the largest trophy, the trophy of grace. Do you know why? Because you had the gods to come here and confess what you're doing, weeping, because you're repenting and want to flee from it. And I would take that trophy of grace and of the gospel and give it to you and say, well done, go sin no more. Guys, that's the name of the game. Stop pretending. Our children see us. Do you think they do not notice where our hearts are from Monday through Sunday up until 10 25 when we decide to leave the house and come kind of after the hymns finished or maybe came after Sunday school finished they know exactly where our hearts are and then we can go oh, everything is well thank God the Lord is blessing us they can see through our teeth so they leave get your children involved in church but to get them involved, who has to be involved first? Of course you have to be involved first. To get them involved in whatever you're serving in church, you have to be serving. Come, learn what, what dad does or what mom does for church. Come sit here with me. I want to train you. Make them partakers of what you do. Make them partakers of what your heart is. There's a cost to it, yes. What's the cost? Well, it's going to show in our agendas. 
Show me your calendar. How many church-related things are in that calendar? Show me your budget. <laughs> oh, you have a budget. Show me how many kingdom-related things are in that budget. Show me your conversations, your emails, your communications. How many kingdom-related things are part of those communications? And guys, I'm not talking about legalism. This is the gospel. <laughs> Jesus says, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Those are his terms. Paul said, I live for the church, and I'm ready to die for the church if I may somehow complete what is lacking in Christ. I'm willing to do it. If the world still has some hate due to Christ, bring it on on me. I'll suffer it for the sake of his church. That's the gospel. Now, I must stop here, but I'll say this. There are some caveats, some, some things we have to watch from. Make sure your house has the right order. I said it before, I repeat it again. God, mom and dad, children. Let me give you a warning, and I don't want to scare you, but these are the stats that came from a law office, the law offices of Wilkinson and Finkenbeiner. And these are the stats. The average age of divorce in 2022 was 46 years old for men, 44 for women. And as you get older, the chance of divorce increases by 42% in people between the ages of 45 and 54. That is scary. That is scary. Do you know why? The empty nest syndrome. You women made the children the center of the house. No time for the husband. All is about the children. And when the children leave, what do you have? A stranger. And you men made it all about the children and providing for the children and raising money for the children. And when they leave, all you have left is a stranger. Secondly, remember that love triumphs, triumphs over judgment. First John says, perfect love casts away fear. Luther said that when his soul was downcast, he would think on Catherine, his wife, dealing with the children. And he'd say, she's so patient, she's so kind, She's so loving dealing with them that I must admit and believe that God is exactly the way with me. He will not cast me to hell. He will deal with my sins patiently as well. Choose hope over fear. Choose to encourage over discourage with paranoid threats. There's a lot of Latina mothers here. You know what I'm talking about. All these threats. All these paranoid threats. All these prophecies of doom. Remember Paul's ministry with the Thessalonians. He says, I was like a nursing mother with you. Sometimes I had to be like a father. And be firm in my correction. And be bold in my instruction. But many times I was like a nursing mother and just care for you and pamper you and cherish you. We have to be both. What voice will your children hear when they are adults? Personal example, and I hope I'm not doing any wrong with that or violating the fifth commandment. But I was one of those children that instead of having their dads <laughs> encouraging them when they go to play bas baseball, my dad was my first mocker when I played baseball. So I, 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 to this day, I cannot grab a baseball bat. If there's people watching, all I hear is my father's voice mocking me or calling me idiot. I'm not saying this for you to pity me. I'm 61. I survived. Everything is survivable. Point is, what voice do you want your children to hear? When I practiced Taekwondo, 
I remember that I would tell Maria Luisa, the hardest thing for me to do the form in Taekwondo is that I'm seeing my dad, and he's been dead for decades. I'm seeing my dad mocking me in my form. What do you want your children to think when they are adults? What do you want them to hear when you're dead? Do you want them to hear you mocking them or threatening them or humiliating them? Or do you want them to hear the voice of Christ in the gospel taught by you, modeled by you? It's your choice. I don't care what your parents did to you. It's your choice <laughs> to break and stop the cycle. Don't lose the present by thinking over the future. Don't lose the time you have now with your children. The shortest time you will have with them is now. By thinking, how are you going to pay for their tuition? How are you going to cover for their needs? How are you going to whatever? What they need is you. What they need is your example, your teaching, your voice, your instruction. Malachi 2.17 speaks about the raising of that godly generation. It starts at home. Beloved, we must be committed to raising a godly generation. Amen. Father, bless your word. We pray, help us, find us where we are faulty. If we cannot amend what we did wrong, may we find consolation in the gospel. May we find consolation in your forgiveness. For those of us who have time, help us to amend our ways and help us to commit to the raising of a godly generation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.